Hey guys, this is your host, Santi Trix, and welcome to the Hollywood Dreams Podcast. After a short vacation, we're back with one hell of an episode, guys. Tonight, we're talking with one of our rock and roll heroes, Mr. Mick Suida. You might remember Mick has been the guitarist for bands like King Cobra, The Bullet Boys, and most recently, The Hot Summers. Come join us as we talk about The Hot Summers' debut album, his 30-plus years musical career, and a lot more. So, a quick heads up before we start, uh, the start of the episode might come off a bit weird because I had to edit out a, a bad sounding part, like the audio was bad, so I had to edit it out. So it might be a bit abrupt, like the start, but yeah, <laughs> so just a quick heads up. But enough rambling, here's Mick. Mick Sweda, how are you, man? Oh, I'm really good. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you having me. We appreciate you being on. Yeah, it's it's a pleasure having you here. It's a pleasure having you, man. So uh, you're uh, uh, you're just off the Monsters of the Mountain uh, Festival, is that so? Yeah, we just got back a little while ago. It was uh, the Hot Summers debut, and we had a lot of fun. It was a it was a good time, and it was nice to see everybody out there after uh, after all this time. Yeah, so was this the first performance uh, with the Hot Summers? Yes, it was the debut performance. So we got oh, wow. to play uh, six or six or eight songs off the record, and we threw in a, a little surprise, and, and that was it. Mm-hmm. I had a good time, and uh, everything came off with, without a hitch. The sound man didn't oh. have my guitar up for the first two songs, but hey, what's uh, <laughs> what's twenty five percent of the band? <laughs> no, that's that's awesome, man. Uh, I, I I bet it was a great show. Um, so let me tell you, I I just love the record. Uh, I I first heard it uh, a few weeks ago, and I thought there was gonna be some modern sounding stuff uh, that I was not gonna like that much. Uh, but it really took me by surprise. I I thought it was straight out of of of, of an eighties uh, like record and uh, I, I i just love the sound uh it was really catchy um i i it's a it's a great album man well thank you that's very kind of you to say i guess the apple doesn't fall too far from the trees i mean that's <laughs> that's kind of when i learned my craft and I've, I've been you know refining it as far as songwriting goes ever since and and shane was uh you know working that same you know neck of the woods when i was so Mm-hmm. I guess there are going to be some some carryover influences, but uh, you know, for the most part, we just wanted to put out a fun record and, and something that was uh, enjoyable to listen to from start to finish. And hopefully, we accomplished that. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, it definitely has that the summer. Well, I mean, it's in the title of the band, right? Uh, but um, it has a summer fun rock and roll experience sound uh right uh and it, and it, it it really resonates with me because i'm a i'm a i'm a i'm a fan of that um uh, 80 late 80s like polished uh, like summertime uh rock and roll sound which i think it it also reminded me a lot of your well of your previous work to be to be honest uh Maybe King Cobra's uh, second album. Uh, it 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 has that sort of vibe as well. Well, yeah, that's why we uh, we actually pulled second time around from that record and played it live at the uh, show, and uh, oh, it seems to fit right into our set, you know. And when when we did that record, um, I had a lot more input on it than I did on the first mm-hmm. one, and I was sort of able to inject you know my power of pop roots into it and. That's primarily why the song fits so well in our set now. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I, I hear the, the the album took a long time to to record. Is that is that so? Yeah, it did. We uh, I met Shane. Oh man, I don't know if it was 2015 or something like that. And uh, you know, we started writing gradually, and and uh, as we got more and more serious, we kept thinking that we had a full album. But then we'd get together and write another song, and mm-hmm. then once we got that done, we'd get together and write another one. And it, it finally got to a point where we just said, okay, this is this has to be the last song we write. We've got to get this record out. Mm-hmm. And uh, we 
had kind of a last uh, last three month push and got it done. Very uh, very happy to say. So, so are you planning to to go on tour with the uh, with the with the band? Well, Besides, yeah, we'd love to. Um, yeah. On uh, one of one of the things that happened is we got the record out on the first day of summer, which was just a fun goal to try to achieve. Um, but the thing is that we didn't really have any infrastructure set up. So we're in the process of doing that now. We we got the record out and we wanted to uh, get this show under our belts. So mm -hmm. those prioritized over everything else, including getting an agent and management and all that. So we're currently in the search uh, for that, putting together an EPK and getting all the things that should have been done beforehand done now. But Who's to say that uh, going about it backwards isn't isn't the way to go for us? So we're uh, we're happy just getting it all together right now. We we figure we've got time on our side. Yeah, that's that's cool. That's that's awesome. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully you can go on tour and enjoy the album because it's a great uh, it's a great record, as I said, and and a lot of people should hear it. Um, a lot of people are actually, and, and I'm happy for that. Um, um, so, uh, but before we, 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 before we, we continue on, on, on that aspect of the album, I wanted to go back a bit and, uh, and discuss maybe about your, your, your influences. Um, what, um, what, what made you want to be uh, a musician? Well, I, uh, was a fan of music and was attracted to sounds and, and pop songs way back in the 60s when I was a little kid. My dad used to play you know, music from uh, Tommy James and um, Bobby Sherman and all those bubblegum idols. And, and my mm -hmm. grandmother owned a bar, and I used to spend a lot of time at the jukebox just playing all these old songs while well, they weren't old at the time. But I, I really became infatuated with music, and, and I don't think I was listening to music as much as I was absorbing it and mm -hmm. studying it and so when i uh i mean obviously i graduated to heavier bands after that and started listening to emerson lake and palmer and the rolling stones and i uh i was walking down the street one day and and i saw a new kid who had just moved into town sitting on his porch playing his telecaster and i got up the uh courage to just go up and introduce myself and and that was it i mean i i realized that you could actually play the instruments too And I went out and got a guitar, I think shortly after that, and convinced a bunch of my friends to play drums and bass. And we started a band and never looked back. What was that, uh, what was that first band? We were called Starcross, and we would play the high school uh, gymnasiums and the dances. And we had a good time doing it. It was, uh, it was fun because we were experimenting with like really rudimentary and frightening flash pots and trying to trying to do all the things that you would do in a in an arena or a theater but uh fortunately we never burned too many things down <laughs> well that's good you don't want to don't want to do that no i no, did that I, wouldn't have been good yeah i read somewhere though that um you you got into college on a drama scholarship did you not Yeah, in fact, the first song I ever played was in this teacher's class. We, my friend and I did a version of uh, The Ballad of Dwight Fry by Alice Cooper. And I think after that, she saw that we had some you know, entertainment leanings, I suppose. And she, she said, you guys want to go to college on a drama scholarship? And I don't know how she pulled it out, whether she knew somebody or, or because we never, I mean, we, we start in plays, and, and that was probably what, what actually got her going because we, we were in high school plays. So next thing I knew I was going to JCC and I wasn't really paying too much attention to class. I was still in a couple of different rock bands and that's where my focus has been ever since that day. Okay. So you weren't doing any like big acting or nothing like that then? No, I starred in, uh, in a play, uh, like a Greek, uh, I think it was called Lysistrata. And uh, after that, I I just kind of worked in the background and concentrated on my bands. I got you. Did any of that um, 
any of that experience, like being around like drama and everything, when you started doing music videos, did you pull any of that out and think, hey, I know what I can do here? <laughs> yeah, I, I did actually. But more importantly was the band that I joined that toured uh, up and down the East Coast. It was called uh, Black Pearl. And we, we had these big white Afro fright wigs and uh, kabuki makeup and kind of were pulling off a, like a third class kiss thing. Okay. And and that's what really allowed me to to learn to perform because I felt like you know when I was on stage I was behind that makeup and then I could just disappear in the crowd after the show and if, if somebody thought I was stupid or somebody didn't like what I was doing they'd never know it was me or at least that was the thinking but in reality I, it it helped me to perform you know without any constrictions and and or restrictions I should say and uh, it was really helpful that band interesting footage of that of the band of that era i'll say it again i'm sorry uh, i was just asking if there's any footage maybe of that that the whole oh. era of the band any, anything that wasn't too embarrassing <laughs> yeah i i wish i, I think anything that uh, would have been taken back then would have been on uh, some very rudimentary equipment and if it exists, I've never seen it, but I'd I'd love to. I mean, that would be great to see uh, that band because we were actually very good. We were playing, you know, Cheap Trick and ZZ Top, and and I liked a lot of the songs we were doing. So I was definitely into it. And uh, unfortunately, in the one tour that we we did, I ended up getting bronchitis, and we had this old school bus that kept breaking down, and I was living on cans of tuna, and I came back completely broke and sick as a dog. But <laughs> you know. Well, that's the price of an education, right? Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Got to struggle for art. Yeah, totally. Oh, I've been there. In the so, uh, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Sam. No, no, no. Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, Mike, your question is probably better than mine. Uh, well, yeah, you say that, but uh, <laughs> so. Um, so by 84, you got approached by Carmine, right, to be part of King Cobra. Uh, how, how did that happen? Did he knew you from any of his, uh, this act, these bands that you were part of? Or how did that came to be? Well, uh, actually, I was, I was about to move back to Maryland to play in, uh, in a cover band. In fact, it's funny, the bass player in Hot Summers knows the guys that I went back in 1984 to play with and he actually played in that band after i auditioned so i was ready to quit la i was done with it because i was in about three different original bands and none of them were doing anything aside from right. rehearsing and maybe recording once in a while so i was mm -hmm. working at tower records and uh the manager for king cobra came in and, and he said hey do you play bass by any chance and uh i said no i play guitar and he's like okay well thanks anyway because obviously they needed a bass player, but then they found Johnny Rod, I guess. And when they started to realize they, they wanted to replace the other guitar player, uh, this guy remembered me and he sent Carmine in. So Carmine himself came in and we talk, talked a little bit. And to be honest with you, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't a Carmine fan. I didn't really know that much about his works. I, uh, I know that I, I loved Jeff Beck up until he started playing with Carmine. Um, and I, I kind of lost track of him after that because, you know, the whole superstition thing and the jamming and all the, you know, the extended, you know, musical, uh, right. all that stuff. I, I wasn't really into that. I was into cool songs that Jeff was doing on like Blow by Blow and Wired. Um, so anyway, that's all I knew of Carmine at that point. And uh, but we had a nice conversation and, and uh, I did the audition and. At that point, they said, well, uh, are you going to dye your hair? And I was like, heck yeah. I'll do, I mean, I, I had I wore a blonde fright wig. Why wouldn't I just dye my hair? So <laughs> there we go. That, that was the, uh, that was it. I got the gig and the rest is history. So you had some success with King Cobra, obviously. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> it had to be, a, where how did the decision come about to actually leave them after two albums and then start a whole new thing? 
Well, it, it, the decision really was was made for me because the band had stagnated. Um, I had forgotten this at the time, but Carmine had gone off to do something. I'm not sure if it was like a vanilla fudge or it was some some band that he had played with before. So we were all just sitting around town, not doing anything. And, and at the same time, prior to that, Carmine had been hooking up with Gene and Paul from Kiss, and we had cut a couple of their songs. And it, it didn't look like we were going to be able to uh, succeed on our own merits. You know, it just looked like Carmine was really sort of flailing about. And uh, so at that point, I said, look, this is this is ridiculous. I can I can go audition guys and start my own band and and it will be so much more rewarding. So I approached Mark and Lonnie from Bullet Boys, who were in King Cobra at the time. And uh, they both said, well, we, you know, this is our big break and we could still make it. And, you know, we're playing with Carmine and we're, we're just going to stick it out. So I started auditioning guys and working on songs in my place, in my little studio. And then eventually they came around and called me and we connected and uh, Bullet Boys, the basis of Bullet Boys was formed at that time. Okay. Now, um, did you guys get the record deal right away or how did that, uh, how did that come about? Well, it was, certainly wasn't right away, but it was, it was pretty quick by most people's standards. I, uh, I was on the strip one night and we, we put together some good songs and I, I was really happy with where we were uh, musically. And I saw the guy who was our former merchandiser for King Cobra. And he, he we started talking and he said, well, I'm getting into management. So if you ever have anything that you, you like, you know, give me a, give me a ring and, and I'll check it out. So sure enough, I did. And he saw some promise and we uh, had to work through some fiery hoops to get together and he had to separate from another management partner or whatever. So it took some finagling, but we ended up uh, getting together and he played, uh, we, we had a demo. We got money from CBS to do a demo and they passed on it. And we had to wait, I think 30 days in order to shop that demo. Uh, but once we did, we started getting some bites and people came out and heard us and, and the people from Warner brothers, uh, like us, and it was a done deal right after that. Okay, so what's the story with Warner Brothers hooking up with you guys? Was there a potential to like making you guys the next Van Halen? Because I remember as a kid, Metal Edge magazine, all the all the ads were like, "Here's the next Van Halen." They, they hooked you guys up with Ted Temple and and everything. I mean, what was what was the deal behind that? What what was the goal there? Well, there there was never a goal. That was never uh, spoken of. In fact, from my perspective, I had to tone down a lot of uh, the stuff that I was doing uh, guitar wise. I I, did, I took a lot of you know the hammer ons out, and I tried to uh, go in a different in a, a bluesier, more tasteful direction, uh, specifically because I didn't want those uh, comparisons to come out. Um, obviously right. there wasn't much I could do about Mark. I mean, he, he drew more of those comparisons certainly than I did, but, uh, you know, I'm not going to compete with Eddie Van Halen. I, I would never want to. And certainly I, I'm more interested in developing a style of my own to begin with. So there was a conscious decision not to sound like Van Halen on my part. Um, but obviously that didn't work out very well. And, we were supposed to be the next Van Halen anyway, so <laughs> there goes that. Well, I always, dude, I always appreciated your style and what, especially, I, I remember seeing Smooth Up In Ya, the, when, I don't know, it probably, probably premiered on Headbangers Bar or whatever. And I yeah. remember as a kid, I was just like, I was blown away, man. I, I thought, like, that was it, man. Me and, me and my buddy just looked at each other like, oh, this, these guys are going to be good. And I remember. Oh, that's cool. Dude, I remember running out and getting the tape when it first came out, cassette tape. I wasn't buying vinyl back then or anything. I, I had the cassette tape. And, uh, dude, I was just telling Santi earlier, I remember at school, we were at school, and I'm going through, like, one of those, um, like, a science book. And I'm just flipping through because I never paid attention anyway. And I'm flipping through, and, dude, there's your guy's album cover in a science book. 
with the bullet and the apple. And I was just like, <laughs> oh, wow. I, started drawing, I started drawing the logo on top. Totally <laughs> messed up his school book. I'm sure the teachers <laughs> love that. Uh, but I, I wrote yeah. bullet points on there. <laughs> I mean, it was, but to see it in like a science book, I was like, all right, this is the coolest school book I've ever seen. And, right. Uh, yeah, that's that, that was pretty amazing. That that guy was doing that work, I think, in the '30s and '40s. And uh, to be honest with you, I I just like the the color blue. You know, that blue really spoke to me, obviously with the contrasting cool. red of the apple and all that. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, we we really thought that that was uh, a good looking shot and had some historical value. Um, and I was gonna make another point that that you sort of landed on in terms of uh geez, was it you didn't hear anything i don't know maybe i'll come back to it but uh yeah it was uh it was uh you know it was very nice for us to come out and have a little uh little success with that yeah i mean it's actually one of i don't know i think i think it's a really good debut album and uh what was it like working with uh with ted well, that had to be actually all Van Halen stuff out the window, that still had to be pretty cool to like be in the studio with him. Uh, yeah, it, ultimately it was. I mean, he wouldn't have been one of the guys that I chose to work with. In fact, uh, I was I was hoping we could get somebody like Brendan O'Brien, who had been doing the Stone Temple Pilot stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought he could get us, you know, a much more organic and, and meteor sound. And to be honest with you, I, I didn't care what Ted had done with one of my favorite bands had done with Mirror's record from Aerosmith. Okay. So I, I was kind of, uh, and you know, not to mention the Van Halen thing. Um, so Ted wasn't one of the front runners for me, but once we started working together, uh, I learned a lot, learned a lot from Ted. And, and uh, although he, as a superstar producer, he could pick and choose when he wanted to come into the studio, which was not the way I like to work. Um, we, uh, you know, we finally got it done at great expense and and over quite a long period of time. Um, so, you know, when it finally came out uh, and people liked it, I was very pleased. I know I liked it. <laughs> I was oh, good. Right on. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing it's... album, definitely. Uh, the the three the three um, Warner Brothers albums are are. are Mason, in my opinion. Uh, even, uh, so, thank you. Yes, so Zaza, the, the, the 93 album, usually gets overlooked by fans, uh, which I think it's very, it, 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 it's a mistake to do so because uh, there's some, some great songs over there. But maybe, uh, maybe because of the year it was released, they got overlooked, stuff like that. But I, I don't know, songs like 1 oh, uh, 800 Goodbye uh, or um, Laughing with the Dead. Uh, I I just love those songs as well. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. We we put our heart and soul into that record, and you know the band was was sort of imploding at that point, so it was uh, it was definitely a, an interesting record to make. And Ted was largely absent for for huge parts of that. Um, mm-hmm. So it you know it was a, a little different process for us. But I, uh, I'm the same way. Like I, I sort of walk away from the records and, and try not to listen to them too much once uh, once they're done, because you get too close, you know, and you can't really be objective. And in fact, I'm just right. starting to get there with with the Hot Summers record. <laughs> um, but when I listen to those, you know, that record, the third one especially, it's like, wow, okay, there was some good stuff on here. This is this is actually really good. I was I'm, uh, I find myself a little surprised occasionally. Yeah, I, I think that's I think that's my favorite record of the three. Uh, oh wow, that's cool. Definitely. I've heard yeah. that before. That's funny. I mean, there's there, <laughs> a lot of a lot of good guitar parts on there that I go back and I'm like I'm really impressed with. Uh, I just think that the album as a whole. I mean, and and sometimes maybe maybe it's the uh, dysfunction that <laughs> kind of pushes those kind of albums out because I mean a lot of bands have those albums. I have. Like uh, Skid Row, for example, I think the Subhuman Race album is phenomenal, and they they were kind of in the same boat, with you know the band was falling apart and had all this stuff going on, and music was changing. Even you know even for you guys at that time, that the music scene was definitely. I mean, you had to see the 
how it was changing. I mean, so the system. Oh yeah, we were we were neck deep in it, and yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. You know, the like you said, the dysfunction and the you know all the calamity surrounding bands. I mean, Van Halen's put a few albums out under those circumstances too. You know, they they weren't exactly the most cohesive unit when Women and Children came out and Diver Down and all that. So, yeah, there's a lot to be said for uh, bickering and fighting, huh? I guess. Hmm. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, where did you guys think, like like you personally, as a guitar player, playing the style that you were playing and what you were used to, when the whole grunge thing started to happen? Um, how did you feel as a guitar player? Like, Did you feel like, okay, this is this is going to end badly for me or did you like figure out a way that you might adapt to do something else in that time? Well, uh, I suppose it was pretty interesting because at, at that point, at the point that I, I left Bullet Boys in 1993 and grunge was in full swing and, and nobody was really doing the kind of rock that we were doing. Certainly nobody was doing anything like, like what we were trying to do um, or at least that I was aware of. Uh, I got together with another, a couple of guys and, and did some rock stuff that was more commercially uh, acceptable, I suppose you'd say. So I, I still wanted to, to try to get some, some hits out there. But then when, when uh, that didn't come to fruition, I really just wanted to do acoustic sort of ambient stuff. Not necessarily all acoustic, but I wanted to kind of mellow out and have some space and be able to uh, be able to you know play a more subdued sort of thing not even rock really for that matter so that's kind of where my head was at I didn't I didn't like anything about the grunge movement so I didn't I didn't want to go there so I just kind of abandoned rock entirely and, and started playing a lot more acoustic and doing some more ambient stuff and uh, after that, I, I met a couple of guys that uh, uh, went on to play in Five Finger Death Punch, and we started a band, and I got back into rock, and so I, it never never leaves the body, but uh, can leave the mind sometimes. I got you. And, and you actually got back uh, with King Cobra, right, in the early 2000s? Yeah, much, much, much later on, Dave called and he said, hey, we'd love for you to, you know, love for you to play on these songs that I have. Uh, I didn't do any writing on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I just threw some guitar parts down and it uh, turned out pretty well. I think Carmine's still using those songs on his various comp compilation albums. So he's getting as much mileage out of them as he can, as usual. <laughs> So, so uh, I I read somewhere that Earl Slick, uh, David Bowie's guitarist, uh, played on some of those records as well. Oh uh, yeah, you... I, I wouldn't doubt it. I wouldn't put it past you know Carmine to hire or, or <laughs> get anybody. I mean, I I think a lot of times, uh, like the King Cobra project, you know, they get so watered down with other players, and it, it's. The only thing that's King Cobra about it is Carmine, you know, at certain points. So, right. you know, with all due respect, anything to lend some legitimacy to what he's doing, I think he's he's all for. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, I personally uh, consider the first the first three albums as King Cobra, like pure King Cobra. Uh, <laughs> Uh, at least that's my opinion. Uh, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. Mark Free. Mark Free is one of my favorite singers. Uh, so I, I really love those albums, especially the second one, which I, I think it's, it must be one of my favorite albums actually. Uh, Thrill of a Lifetime. It's, it's, uh, but yeah, yeah. I, 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 I tend to agree with you on that. Um, so this project. So with with all the lineup changes, this band sometimes get. It's hard to track. <laughs> it's hard to track who's who's who who's playing on 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 a, on a on a band any given day, right? Well, the last time he asked me to go out and do something, I said, "Yeah, if Marcy's going to go, I will go, but not mm -hmm. unless." And and so, I guess Marcy doesn't want anything to do with any of that. So, 
Uh, right. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So, uh, so nowadays, so uh, besides uh, the hot summers, are, are you are you involved in, in anything else musically nowadays? Any any no, solo actually, albums? Thank you. No, well, I uh, I, I'm really interested in in what is known as post rock, which is really a, kind of a version of what I was just talking about earlier. It's it's ambient music without that's instrumental for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, and at some point, I want to delve into that. I've already got a couple of songs that I I want to try to finish. Um, but at this point, the Hot Summers is my focus, and, and I'm really wanting to get some legs under the record and and uh, get that going and get out and tour like you guys were asking about earlier so that yeah. that is my focus at this point yeah that'd be cool to see you on the road again and doing that speaking of touring i'm gonna take you back a few years <laughs> do you remember playing the akron rubber bowl with bon jovi let's see because i'm from cleveland so the akron oh, rubber right bowl on. With uh, Bon, it was Bon Jovi, you guys, Cinderella, and Winger, I believe. Yeah, I do remember that absolutely, <laughs> dude. That was for, for I a think, few different reasons. Okay, okay, we gotta hear this. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I just uh, I remember the show for one thing. It was really fun for us. I I don't know if we've played many bigger venues than that. You know, at least outdoors. I mean, dude, we played was, a bunch of sheds, but. Dude, it was jam, yeah. man. I, I was there, so, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it was a great lineup. So, so I think we've finished our set and we're kind of hanging out in our dressing room. And uh, I think I'm in there with, uh, with Jimmy and, um, and now Cher walks in, right? And of course she's stunning and tall and gorgeous. And uh, she comes, just walks right, saunters into our dressing room. I think, I don't know, she picked up a drink or something, you know? And the next thing you know, Jimmy's like, can I help you? And she just kind of looks down and knows at him and turns around and, and walks out. But I just, I'll never forget Jimmy saying to share, can I help you with something? And it was so funny. At least oh, I thought it was be, funny at the time. She had to be pretty salty about that. She was probably like, who is this guy? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I, I remember, I remember Richie, like, Richie doing a bunch of lines off his, you know, guitar rig. I thought that was pretty sweet at the time, but I'm glad I wasn't into that. Oh, the 80s. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah, was too I, much at least. Man, I remember you guys, you guys were, you guys were definitely on fire that night. I remember that. Oh, you thank guys, you. And I remember you guys going on pretty early too. I, I remember that show. Yo, yeah, oh, yeah. Somewhat early. Yeah, it was daylight. I totally, I totally remember it being daylight, but. We always had the approach that we wanted to go out and kill it, you know, and, and we wanted to be remembered and we wanted to make a mark and and uh, that uh, hopefully we accomplish more more often than not. Yeah, and I uh, and I saw you guys also with the Cinderella tour, you know, it was just you guys with Winger and Cinderella. And um, oh well, thanks for coming out early. <laughs> man, I was trying everything to to see you guys. I was really. <laughs> Telling you, man, I was a big fan, a big fan. And when you guys got the reunion together, I was really stoked. Unfortunately, that didn't last very long. Um, is that something you care to talk about and maybe get anything off your chest about that? What happened? Well, with that? Uh, that that's all done. But um, yeah, we tried a few times uh, to pull it back together because uh, for me personally, I, I just wanted to try to uh, resuscitate the brand and, and try to rehabilitate it more than anything, you know, because Mark's been out with, uh, again, respectfully, his scab players. And, you know, you can go on the Wikipedia page and, and see how long that list is. So, I, you know, I, I, I mean, that band was my baby when we started it. And I wanted it to, you know, be, I wanted it to go to rest with respect and dignity. And uh, so that's why I invested my time and energy in, in uh, the few times I tried to get back together. Uh, this last time I thought, you know, that there was a hope that, that although there was a shelf life, obviously, there was a hope that we could maybe go out and do some nice runs and, and show some people that, you know, we still had it. And um, unfortunately that wasn't to be it. Uh, they, you know, 
old things always seem to flare up and uh it ended it ended a lot quicker than than we'd all hoped yeah but but, honestly i was in i was in shock man i was like it's because it seemed like everything was going cool you know i was seeing videos of you guys playing you guys sounded great and everything seemed like it was pretty solid and then next thing i know it's like you know i think lonnie was it lonnie that left first and then and it was just like i read that and then next thing i know everybody i was like what happened (laughs) so as a fan fan, it was just it was just like a shock yeah it was we had a a show to play at the whiskey and it ended up not coming off unfortunately um so that that was pretty much the demise um but yeah it was it sucked because we uh we ended up going on the monsters of rock cruise in 2020 and i remember at the time everybody was saying look there's something happening in asia we're not going to have any asian people on the anybody from asia i should say on the boat um and so th- that was always in the back of our heads like man it, you know people are getting sick i hope we're going to be okay on this thing Everybody ended up being fine, but then as soon as we got off the boat, that's when everything shut down and the pandemic hit hard. And people were really getting yeah. sick, and uh, we were hoping to, you know, recover from that. And uh, we started to started to get, you know, some momentum going, but it wasn't to be. And I, uh, I'll be honest with you, when there's so much, you know, stress and negativity involved in uh, in the band for the most part that when when it does fall apart it always ends up being a relief it always ends up being like okay great i can get some sleep i don't have to worry about this anymore and and i'll move on to the next thing and ultimately it resulted in the hot summers record coming out so happy happy joy joy yeah (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. i guess it's more important to be healthy and and happy you know yeah ultimately i mean i you know throughout the the history of the band i certainly have not been healthy and happy because of the very same things you know i mean like i always say uh 99 of the bands that fold up are because somebody you know grabbed someone's earplugs and the guy couldn't forget about it and they got in a fight and you know suddenly a great band falls apart over some fucking earplugs you know but and that happened to me but i I, I knew that there was a greater cause and, and that the thing was bigger than just me and my damn earplugs. And so, you know, you put a lot of stuff up on a shelf and store it in a box and it doesn't really go anywhere and you never forget about it, but you have to put it aside if you want to succeed. So, you know, for all you guys out there that are fighting with your singer, if you're good, put it aside, you know, wield on. Yeah, <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of people can't seem to get get past yeah. things. It's and crazy. I don't blame them for that either. You know, I mean, if there's just too much bullshit, that's that's just the way it has to has to be. But yeah, you know, for me, uh, I guess I guess I'd say you know, three records on a major label and world tours all over the place is mm-hmm. probably worth it for me to, you know, forget about that stuff and go about my business. So. Yeah, but I mean, you still have a lot to look back at and a lot to be proud of, and um, and we're Definitely, you know yeah. we're still fans, I mean, and fans are still out there, and you know, um, and very appreciative for what you do, you know, and, and what you have done. So well, thank you, and I I hear that a lot, and that's that's important to me. You know, there's a there's a lot of people that. Uh, really enjoyed what we did and we're rooting for us and and that is a big part of why you know why i did it and why i stuck it out but um you know it's just disappointing that we can't be out there doing it still and that a lot of people didn't didn't get to see us that's uh that's unfortunate and something that i'll always you know wish was was different yeah yeah, and it's also amazing. It's also great that uh, you are putting out new music uh, for for your fans. Uh, new music that sounds fresh and, and and new, even though it has this this uh, classic uh, sound to it, or at least a style. I would say that sound, that style. Uh, I 
think that that's awesome. Uh, and it really, it, it, the hot, back to the hot summers, I think it's a, it's a batch of fresh air, right? Uh, I, I I was I was telling this uh, David this before the before the, we started the call that uh, a lot of bands nowadays uh, sound pretty much the same. Uh, I mean, a lot of bands that got their careers started back in the day and they're all these new comeback albums or or next albums, you know, they they all they they all sound pretty much similar to me. <laughs> um, uh, but the hot summer is not that. It's it's different, right? It has the, so uh, ironically, right? Uh, by being more faithful to the original '80s style sound, that that sounds fresher than a lot, what a lot of other bands are are putting out. We, I I say that without uh, throwing anyone under the bus. I just uh, I just think it's uh, it's great to hear uh, that style of music still being played and in such a good way as well. Well, I I totally agree. I. I've uh, heard a lot of things that have come out, and there there is a tendency for it to be uh, a bit homogenized, and I'm not sure why that is. I, w- I would think that people would have, you know, the ability to, you know, have a more distinctive sound, and and uh, I really appreciate your kind words. I I like to think we have that distinctive sound, you know, whether uh, whether. Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know how to describe it. That's a that's the thing. Like when you when you call it like it, like it's got a bit of a classic feel to it. That's that's kind of what we were going for. We wanted people to re- remember our songs. We don't want them to be disposable, and we don't want them to uh, leave your memory banks in you know thirty or forty seconds. So hopefully, right. uh, hopefully people will dig it. Hopefully they'll remember the hooks and remember the songs, and hopefully it'll last uh a lifetime yeah for sure man and it's not and it's not a nostalgia thing either it's not like hey remember us no it's it's something new and and fresh so that's that's cool it, I don't it know sounds like, yeah that's important for us it sounds yeah. like and that, that was one of the things you know, somebody sure. said at monsters on the mountain they they were really happy that we were able to do it without relying on some sort of legacy you know we, we created something new and we did it of our own uh volition and you know although we we didn't have you know we don't have a legacy band's pre-existing audience we have to i mean we're kind of a baby band and we have to build that but we're perfectly happy doing that and and we were happy with the turnout and and the response that we got where did the uh where did the name come from i um i just thought it was it was uh very suitable for the sound we were going for. I uh, I thought that it was a, a bit of a play on words at the time, and uh, it wasn't. It, it took the guys to you know, a little bit to get used to it. I was, you know, it wasn't an immediate sell, but uh, over time, I I think it it ended up describing how we sound and and the kind of more than anything the kind of ambience that we we want to put out with our music. I mean, we really want people to roll down their windows and put the top down and, you know, drive down the, the street with their hair and blowing in the wind and our music cranking loudly. And, and it's just that kind of a feel mm-hmm. that we, uh, we were going for. So I think the name suits that. Well, uh, you definitely succeeded for sure. Yeah. No, I, no, wish, I wish I, I still so. had my hair that could blow in the wind, but unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right. So, so Mick, uh, we all we always like to finish off our show, our episodes with a little top three favorite albums, all t- all time favorite albums. Uh, so what what do we start? What are what would you say are yours? Wow, that's uh, now you guys understand that this this can be like something that changes on a daily basis, right? Absolutely, um, yeah. <laughs> but I would I would say that Cheap Trick's first album has to be that's a Desert Island record for me. Um, I yeah. I can listen to that record it's in its entirety endlessly. I, I think it's a perfect perfect record. Um, Another one that I think is a perfect record is uh, 
uh, there's a band called 2020. I think they were on a CBS uh, label called Portrait. And uh, they were like a power pop band. But that record to me, again, it's, it's a perfect record. I just love it. Um, and yeah. let's see, what would, what would a third record be for me? Probably Jean-Luc Ponty's Cosmic Messenger. That's a, that's a, he's, he's, that's a he's left a French side. Violinist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's, he's more of a jazz cat. It's an instrumental album, but it's, uh, it's a stunner. And again, it's, it's picture perfect for me. So I'll take those three. Well, that's, that, yeah. I mean, that, 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 that's an interesting one. Yeah. We also, we always get like, uh, the, when people, we always get KS and Rolling Stones, you know. <laughs> it's 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 yeah. Nice to have one of my yeah. favorites. Which it seems to get spoken of is Def Leppard's High and Dry, which is like one of my favorite albums. I mean, yeah. We've had so many. Right. That. <laughs> so many, so many people told. Yeah, uh, it's good to have something different, and it, I'm definitely I get, so uh, it's uh, more of an eclectic list, uh, which I like, and uh, I think uh, that. That that uh, that transpires into your music definitely. I can see that those influences. Definitely okay, so, so list. <laughs> yeah. Are you ready for my next three now? And then the three after that? Yes, the three let's after that. Keep going. <laughs> I got a lot of favorite albums. Oh, there's so many good albums. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean we could be we could be here all all day, definitely. <laughs> it, it is it is hard to narrow narrow down. Like mine, I like I tend to go for like I know Def Leppard High and Dry, man. That is a staple for me. Uh Riot's Fire Down Under album. I love that album. I mean, there's so many like different different rock albums that I just absolutely love. And and some non rock Yeah, albums. you're a rocker. No, I, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I I have my <laughs> I, I I know where uh I know where I stand on that. Yeah, yeah, right on. Yeah, it's interesting when you, I was thinking about it the other day, and, and obviously this is something that everybody's thought of one, one time or another, but I mean, imagine, imagine in the history of humankind being born at this time, you know, when Dark Side of the Moon was released and High and Dry was released and Cheap Tricks first record and, and Elvis was alive. And, and it's just amazing that yeah. we were all sort of born at a time to experience all this stuff. And it's not just music, it's, you know, technology and, and everything else. But I mean, it's, it's almost like, man, I, I couldn't imagine being born at any other time in the history of humankind. It's just kind of wild when you really think about it. Yeah, it is nuts, but we'd have to step back a little bit because only two of us were born during that time. Well, that's, that's, not, oh my that's God. not that's not fair. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I mean, just uh, myself. No. <laughs> no. Come on, no, Sandy, okay. you're, you're what seventeen years younger than I am. <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm thirty, uh, so I I, I experience uh, less than you guys, I guess. But I I, I consider myself a twentieth century twentieth century boy, as Mark Volan would say. <laughs> Hey man, well, you're you're probably you are. if it's in your heart, it's in your heart. If it's in your blood, yeah, it's in your blood. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can always simplify it and say, look, we were born in a time when we know who David Bowie was and probably could hear his music. So we yeah. can simplify it that way. Yes, definitely. Yeah, just to be just to be born in, the, in an era where we can hear David Bowie's music, I think that's uh, that's incredible. Definitely. <laughs> just cause, yeah. It just kind of covers yeah. the gamut. Yeah, definitely. And, and, uh, and you guys just named off my my number three. Mm -hmm. Sing Stardust, man. Oh, Rise and fall yeah. Oh, yeah. Album. So good. So good. Oh, yeah. That that would have been down my list at some point. Absolutely. Uh, so good. Mm, definitely, yeah. All right, Nick. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you here, man. And uh, it's yeah, I, I mean, we could talk with you for hours, uh, but... Uh, you're busy, like man. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, but it's it's been a pleasure, man. Uh, uh, I I love talking with you. Yeah, let's do it again sometime. I dig you guys too. And uh, again, thank you for all the kind words. And uh, obviously, the Hot Summers record is available uh, on all the all the sites that you're familiar with. And you yeah. can get in touch with me on on my Facebook page or my Instagram and. 
and uh, we'll hook you up. We've got shirts, CDs, and mm-hmm. lots of love. So fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to keep in touch with you, man. You're, you're like, uh, and I'm not just saying this, but you were like one of my idols. You were like one of my rock idols. And um, Aw, dude, thank you so much. I, no, it just means a lot that I get to actually speak to you 30 some years later, but <laughs> it's, <laughs> that's, it's awesome. where was, uh, where did we play with uh, Cinderella out there? We, was it in Cleveland? Uh, yes, it was. It was at, I believe that was, now let me think, was that the old Richfield Coliseum? I believe. Oh, okay. That sounds I right. Was, I think that was the old Richfield Coliseum. And then, yeah, um, that sounds right. And then the Akron Rubber Bowl. And I, then I think you guys came back. I might have missed this one, but I think you guys came back and maybe played the Akron Agora. Oh yeah, we did for sure. So, in fact, we and, were in town. I think I think Blue Murder was there, like the night before or whatever. Oh yeah, dude, they they were bands every night. Yeah, they were bands every night, and yeah, it, that wouldn't surprise me. Blue Murder, yeah. I mean, and uh, I'm trying to think if I saw you guys. I know I I got the pay per view event that you guys i think you opened for ozzy on that oh yeah a, i think it was a pay-per-view event and um i remember just being uh, you know me being I, I would i would try to get all those pay-per-view events that came out back then <laughs> yeah and, uh, <laughs> yeah I, I just remember that that, that seemed a little that seemed a little awkward i wasn't there but it seemed like that was a rough crowd to play to um well <laughs> yeah i think anybody about. I don't know who you would have to be to successfully open for Ozzy, but let's just say that Mark didn't really help our cause by going out there the way he did. On the other hand, I give him full marks, you know, and give him credit because he didn't, you know, he wasn't intimidated. He didn't back oh. down. You know, he stayed in everybody's faces, and whether they liked it or not, he, he gave him what he had. So, um, you know, to me, I'm, I'm proud of that. They can uh, – you know, those guys can boo all they want, but it doesn't mean we're going to do anything any differently, you know? Yeah, for sure. And it never, you know, that kind of stuff, I, you know, I, I've always been proud of being a fan of this music, this genre, and I've definitely waved the flag pretty high. <laughs> Santi, would you agree? Yeah, <laughs> I, I definitely right on, agree. <laughs> so, sometimes too high. But no, hey, have you ever played South America? I'm from Argentina, by the way. So, have you ever played South America? I have not, and I can't wait to do it because there are. Uh, I get so many messages from like young people, kids. I mean, twenty somethings who just love King Cobra. Yeah, and obviously they like bullet boys and and all of that, but it's just amazing that they go back to 1985, you know, and in, in their, uh, I mean, when they were just little. So it's kind of wild. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, music, yeah. They, music music wow. never dies, man. It absolutely. That's right. Well, well, let me tell you, we have a lot of fans here in Argentina. So whenever you want to uh, bring the hot summers. Uh, We'll, we'll we'll wait for you with our arms open, <laughs> with open arms. <laughs> nice. Yeah, and I'll, I'll in the be meantime, the closest I'm waiting for you guys. Right on. Well, the closest I get to Argentina is riding my Peloton, so I'll uh, I'll make <laughs> Argentina my next trip. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining the show. Thank you, guys. I sure appreciate you having me on, and let's uh, let's do it again soon. Awesome. Thank you, man. Awesome. It was awesome. Thank All you. right, bye. It, man. Be safe. Right. You too. Take okay. care. All right, folks. Sadly, that's all the time we have for today, but what an episode, right? Don't forget to hit the follow button on Spotify and share it with your friends. You can also follow us on Instagram at hollywood.dreams.podcast. And rock on!